Hello, hello, hello. Happy Tuesday. Um, happy July. I hope um, you all had some time to rest and uh, rejuvenate over the holiday weekend and spend time with uh, loved ones and family. Uh, I was with my parents um, and uh, it was nice to, nice to be home with mom and dad over the holiday weekend and, um, and just uh, spend some quality time with my family. I am delighted uh, for this week's Hummingbird Hour. Um, and for those of you who've been with us before, Hummingbird Hour is our weekly conversation series um, in May, June, and July this year, uh, which we are uh, doing to celebrate Hummingbird's one year anniversary. Um, and, um, and we're sharing stories and um, messages from different voices uh, who make an impact on the world and help make uh, companies and organizations uh, inclusive of everyone. And like the slide here says, uh, Hummingbird Hour is recorded. And when we share the recording on our YouTube channel and on our website, uh, the, the um, closed captioning will be added to the, the video. And we also um, include the transcript, transcript on our website for those who prefer to uh, engage in the content that way. Okay, so I'm gonna take the slide down. Again, happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. My friend and colleague, um, Rana Reeves is here with me today. Uh, Rana is one of my favorite humans um, and I'm so glad that he said yes. Um, Rana and I met uh, when I worked, was working at Tapestry, which is the home of coach Kate Spade and Stuart Weitzman. Um, and Rana has worked with the coach brand for a number of years and we got a chance to work together and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, he's someone I've learned learned a lot from um, over the years. Um, so Rana, thanks for being here today. That's okay, Brian. It's always good to chat to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Would, would you uh, share for our guest viewers who don't know Rana Reeves, I know the Jennifer Brown community is a big fan of yours. Um, and uh, so some of those Jennifer Brown community members are here. Uh, we probably have some people who haven't heard of you before. Would you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, what do you want me to share about me or the agency? Okay. Both, okay. both. We 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 talk about who we are and what we do here at Hummingbird. Yeah, yeah so you know, I, well, Rana, I live in New York. As you can tell, I'm from the UK. I kind of uh, grew up in Essex, which is just outside of uh, London, and I began my career. I, I've got a degree in uh, politics, but I began my career in '96, which is going to age me. Um, in the UK, and it was really at this moment when I've, I've thought about this a lot, that, um, you know, one thing I'm sure we're coming to talk about, Brian, is the power of language and, and lexicon. And I grew up in this time when um, they, they called it youth culture at the time. So youth culture was emerging as like a real dominant kind of cultural way of marketing to brands. So club culture, drag queens, but they, they basically put everything, which I now understand to maybe be D&I, into this term. So black culture, South Asian culture, gay culture, was all put into this term, youth culture. Looking back now, I can understand that, but we didn't have a language around it then. So I kind of grew up in the industry. I started off as a publicist um, and then developed kind of campaigns that were very much intrinsic to me and my identity, certainly, you know, again, now we, we would talk about it being intersectionality, but kind of um, being a British South Asian, you know, family of immigrants, uh, being a gay man, you know, all the different things that make up me would, would come through in my work. This is all still pre-internet. Then the internet kind of happened and uh, it really, you know, I would say that and now I'm considered someone that works in the ad industry, but at the time I, the ad industry didn't really want people like me. So I didn't work in the ad industry, I was a publicist, but the internet kind of democratized the way the channels and the way that content is created and also consumed, which kind of took it away from some of these like ivory tower ad agencies to kids like me. Uh, I moved to the US about six years ago. So I'd set up an agency, worked in loads of different brands, W Hotels, O2, Beats by Dre, Adidas, um, did a stint for a year as uh, Sean Coombs, 
you'll know is Diddy's creative director. And now I have my own um, marketing agency, I suppose you'd call it called Ranaverse. And we work for a different a range of different brands. So we work, as, as you said already, for Coach, we work for Soul Cycle, Equinox, uh, General Motors. We're just in the process of working with them on their electric vehicle push, uh, Boss, and uh, Unilever. Is a, is, is a big client of ours that we do kind of different work within the kind of purpose-driven space, I would call it in our language. So that's a very small kind of 46 years of Rana. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to encapsulate our career journeys when we get to be our age. <laughs> and in just a couple of minutes, here's a few highlights. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll certainly cover, cover a lot more. Um, well, I, I want to share um, with the group a bit about, you know, how I really feel like I've learned from you and what the power of our, our um, partnership and collaboration has been. Um, and it, it actually was part of the influence to the Representation Matters paper that we released a couple of weeks ago, where we talk about the four lenses of representation um, and those four lenses that we use are people, culture, community, and customers. And um, and when, when we first met uh, and I was, still getting my feet under me as a head of diversity and inclusion at Tapestry uh, and really um, learning a lot about the landscape of what, what it means to create an inclusive environment where uh, we see representation really come to life um, in the company. What really emerged for me um, as you know, with, with what we got to work on at Coach was that the, the, real, the true importance of the, and the way I talk about it now with our clients is there's an internal expression of DEI and an external expression of DEI, and we use different words sometimes. So social impact can sometimes be the external expression. Um, and, uh, and I think that was something that I really learned from you as we, as we got to, to work together. And I know that's why, I think that's why you get, you know, companies are calling you to help them uh, bring their external commitment to DEI to life. What, what's that look like for you as you're having, with, having those conversations with your clients? I think the weird thing, Brian, is that it changes. It changes month by month as culture changes. What, what I would say is the first thing that I've seen which is the seismic shift in my industry is the calendar that we work to. So in the old days, and it, this calendar still exists, it would be Oscars, Grammys, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Coachella, um, Valentine's Day, uh, holidays. Um, and they, they all still exist, but there's been this overlay where brands have, there's been like a, a, a schism and so in the, in the old days, which is probably just about a year ago, um, they kind of lumped philanthropy and human rights into this, into this ball, right? So you'd also have like Breast Cancer Awareness Month or, you know, um, December 1st, National like Global AIDS Day, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, you'd have these particular moments like Black History Month or Pride, right? And they were just like lumped in with just the, the charity stuff you did when you weren't selling shit, right? What there's been, and this is very much, I would argue, predominantly due to the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matter, is there has been a seismic shift into an understanding that there is a human rights calendar, right? And that a lot of these moments that we deal with, that you might deal with internally and I deal with externally, aren't celebratory on the whole for brands. And what I mean by that is that it's not the job or the right of brands to celebrate those moments, right? It's about how do brands show up in allyship to those communities in those moments, right? So, you know, you can't divorce what is going on for black communities now from Black History Month. You can't divorce what is going on for LGBTQ communities now from Pride. You can't divorce from any of these moments what is happening now. And I think that there has been this this move where brands have had to come off of the fence and as well as not just seeing it as philanthropy they've also had to understand that human rights are not political issues in my opinion 
right? Fairness, if you, you can't stand for fairness, equality, and these, these concepts in your brand values, right? If you're not going to get off the fence and stand for them. You can't, or in my opinion, you have no right to celebrate pride if you will not denounce anti-trans laws, right? You don't get to post about Black History Month if you don't support the George Floyd Act, right? Because these are things that are intrinsic. So this whole kind of movement and shift is still going on, which is why it's a very rambling answer to your question, is that it's changing all of the time. But I think that, you know, it, it's just a very exciting time because it's the, I think the communities that we deal with have understood that for a long time. The shift is on the brand side, that brands are understanding now, right? And I would say that arguably it's Gen Z that drive that because if you get it wrong, they will call you out and it affects your bottom line, right? Yeah. The second thing, which is very unique, only America and Brazil have this population where it's practically 50-50 Gen Z is uh, white and non-white right so also the economic figures stand up to that you know I, i'm going to get this wrong slightly but i think it's black people or black and brown people spend the equivalent of the gdp of germany in america right so alongside like the heart of it makes sense to be like this is the head of you can't afford commercially to not be doing this anymore right or you can try and do it but it it's going to be a rocky road. It's going to take you down Chick-fil-A territory. Yeah, well, you know, one of the other um, stats that we captured in the Representation Matters paper and we talk about a lot in our work at Hummingbird is uh, that, um, and there's a couple different models, but, uh, but essentially by 2050, uh, there will be more people of color in the United States than there are white people. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, when I, when I talk to business leaders, I say, you know, here's the thing, if you can choose not to be part of this if you want to, but I think you're starting to then build your business or strategize your business out of business. Uh, because if you're not including everyone, your business, the viability of your business starts to really be, be challenged. This is, this is what people have to understand, Brian, but also it's here now, 16 of the main, of the 20 biggest cities in the United States are non-white majority, right? And then if you go into culture, if you go into music, if you go into sport, if you go into film, if you go into TV, you know, disproportionately, whilst the people behind the scenes may not be black or brown, it's just unequivocal, the, the, the impact in popular culture of black and brown people in this country. So that mixed with the demographic means that you, you almost, you don't have a choice if you want to, have like you say a viable business yeah. can you imagine a business now being able to comfortably say oh yeah we're not really interested in black people and we don't really like the gays <laughs> it, it, it. You, I just I don't know how you would do that. Well, and certainly there are some companies that do um, under um, the um, umbrella of religious choice, which is a another conversation altogether um, mm. and uh, and a complicated one. I, I want to go back to this um, you know the, the, what you were sharing about that standing by your values, um, standing by humans, human rights is not a political issue. Mm. Uh, and I remember when I had the opportunity to work uh, with Victor Luis, uh, who is the CEO at Tapestry, um, when you and I met, he, um, you know, he and um, our head of HR and our head of communications, we spent some time thinking about how do we really demonstrate our commitment to those values and also not be political. Because of course, um, you know, I know, know this is true in places around the globe, certainly in the United States though, uh, the last eight to 10 years, um, well, and that's the, I, I think some people will say it's been this way for many, many years, uh, but the, the last eight to 10 years have been really volatile and contentious here. And, um, and companies are having to say, 
well, what we stand for. And sometimes that what they stand for feels like it's political. Um, and so they have this dance uh, to, to, you know, it's like a tightrope to walk. Uh, and, but I'm, I love the Gen Z population. I'm, I'm like, thank you for being here and, and challenging leaders and, you know, saying, hey, well, you got to do better. So how are you helping your clients? Uh, you know, and I think about the voting work you did uh, of how you're helping them walk that tightrope. Yeah, so often it's about building almost like a team internally so that because often with the you know we work with some really large brands so there'll be external affairs there'll be the PR team there'll be as you've mentioned HR there'll be marketing and it's really all coming into sync so the the general rule of thumb is to be non-partisan particularly when you're dealing with uh, laws right or the right to vote you know yes we did the election last year we've got the midterms coming up uh, next year, which is, is something I'm focusing on at the moment. So it's about things that to me are just sacrosanct concepts. If you take gay marriage, the way that they did it was they talked about love, right? No one can disagree with love. On the whole, you know, unless you're really crazy, you can't really disagree with the idea fundamentally that equality is a fair thing to do, that fairness is a fair thing to do. So what we look at is the right to vote right um and it, it's things like you look at well, what organizations can you work with so you can work with 501c3 organizations right um when you're talking about you know and th those are the ways that i tend to hone in on stuff so if you take the election uh, last year we looked at um the barriers to black and brown people voting right we looked at the barriers to trans and gender non-conforming people voting so id registration a feeling of safety at the polling booth you know uh, misinformation and correct information um you know why your vote matters you know because there can be a feeling of just like well nothing ever changes and it's very much around your right to vote as opposed to this is who you should vote for right when a law is actively discriminating against a population, you know, Unilever are incredible. So with the raft of anti-trans laws that have come out, you know, Unilever came out corporately against those. Um, Tapestry did the same thing. The coach CEO did that. Um, you know, you were involved in that actually. That, that um, you know, came out and said, this is not right. And so I think it's a case by case you know, on what law or what piece of activity you're dealing with, right? And, but it's always about not telling people what to do, but this is just all, at the bottom line, it's all about equity, isn't it? It's just giving everyone the same opportunity as every other people have, right? So it's about, you know, and it's staggering for me coming from Britain, because I'm sure there's some sort of voter suppression, but I don't quite know what it is in Britain, that, you know, it's understanding, well, in this town, they keep all the polling booths in the white areas open, but they shut their ones in the black areas. That's not fair, right? So either we create volunteers to keep those open, or we create transport infrastructure for those black or brown people to go to the, the white area polling booths. That's just about fairness. We're not at any point telling them you should vote, right? You know, there comes a point where if you have a consumer that is just not interested in other people being equal, there's not a lot you can do with them. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Right. But, well, you're not going to make everyone happy, but but if you stand by your values, it's going to it's then you can. Uh, what I found and I is the times in my I'll use my life as an example. The times in my life where I've made decisions that are inconsistent with my values, those caused me the most angst. Um, as long as I stand by my values, some people may not be happy with me, but I can say, but I stood by who I am or who I believe, what I believe in. And I think that works for companies as well. Yeah. And you know, the midterm demographics, you know, what's coming by 2050. So, you know, it's, it's what are you in for commercially? And I think as well, on the whole, you know, one of the things that I've had to learn on a personal level, which I'm, I'm hoping will come through in my work more is this idea of unity, right? So on the whole, people want to see other people thrive in abundance, not in hardship, you know, if you take it on a human level. And my clients, you know, when you drill it down to that, are 
far, far and wide, just nice people that would like to see good in the world. They just also have commercial targets to reach, right? So it's how you marry the two. One of the, the sections, I'm gonna keep going back to the Representation Matters paper because it's, it's, um, it's really the, the way we're trying to engage companies in, in this conversation and all of the various elements of it. We have a section that says, um, it's titled Good for Humanity, Good for Business. Um, and I think you, you've already alluded to this in the conversation or you know, more than alluded, you've, you've, I think, made it clear. Um, but you know, I'm curious if you have other, other things to add about you know, these uh, human-centered uh, commitments uh, to different communities or to the experience of humans as a whole. You know, are, when you're working with your clients, do you help them understand the benefits to their bottom line? Is that part of the conversation as well? Yeah, I think it depends on where you're drawing the line around stuff. Like from a personal level, I have a particular issue with rainbow based products because no one ever releases how many of these things they sell. Right. And certainly walking around pride, I don't see loads, and loads of people in rainbow t-shirts, sneakers, fanny packs, book bags, cans of soda, yada, 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 right? But I think the, you know, I think it, for me, it becomes about nuances. So if, for instance, it, you know, if you're gonna use black culture to sell your products, which I would say by and large, most brands are doing now, any brand that is co-opting MBA style or in music or in a certain nuance of something that to me feels black in the American sense, then what are you giving back to that community? That's what I ask, you, you know? And th those are the sorts of things that I, I really push brands on. I, I'm, I'm pitching for a brand tomorrow, actually. And one of the things that I'm going to say to them is that what's changed is you just, you can't just take from a community with one hand their food or their music or their culture or their design or whatever and not give back with the other right like that's no longer acceptable you know i look at the latinx community you know there's this this kind of this idea of like yeah let's all do cinco de mayo and let's take all these tropes from this community but let's not build you know immigrant populations let's not understand what they're going through mm. right and so that's what i mean about this difference that brands traditionally have wanted to focus on this idea of celebration right which is where they got into with pride where they got into almost celebration is the wrong word but with black history month that it was all about these major milestones in civil rights but what's happening now and so it's 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 how do you build some sort of substance and then how do you enable those communities to celebrate for themselves because unless you're black owned or brown owned or queer owned or women owned at that particular moment it's not your place right? It may be the place of some of your employees, but it's not your place. So it's always for me about, well, how are you as a brand adding that value? But also that doesn't need to be boring. It doesn't need to be uncreative. It doesn't need to be exciting, you, you, you know? And also it doesn't need to be divorced from selling products. Hmm. I'm curious, um... You know, I've used the the stat of by 2050, over 50 percent of the population in the United States will be people of color. Um, and when I talk about so that that's 25 plus years from now, almost 30 years from now. Um, when I talk about DEI work, internal work at companies is I have to help leaders and, and employees often understand we're not going to change it overnight. There's no, there's no switch I can flip as much as I would like to, to make this place, to make any place inclusive or diverse, unless they've been working on it for a really long time. But even that wasn't a flip of a switch. That was intentional, thoughtful, considered work over years. Um, is, is it the same for the, the work you do with, with your, with companies to help them build their brand reputation for as inclusive? I think I think it depends on the brand and depends on the activity like I'm fairly pragmatic so I'll take any brand that wants to do good right obviously they have to have not had a long history of doing really bad ideally but you know I'll start from day dot with a brand and like you say it's about intention and I think that this is this is what I'm trying to say Brian if we'd had this conversation a year ago I think I was more in a space of what I would call angry marketing 
right? It's white people's fault, it's straight people's fault, it's men's fault. And I'm moving towards this idea of teachable moments and unity, right? Which is a softening for me because we have to, at some point, look at solution-based activity. You know, the, the next piece of, you know, I'm looking at allyship. And what does that mean? How can people show up? Because I think that it's really important to put out positive representation of communities, but also actionable purpose that how people can show up, right? And so that's a lot of what I'm beginning to think about now, but you can only do that when you've created an environment where marginalized people have some level of equity or, or are at the table. Right. So each business is so what tends to happen with the business is it depends on who they are. If it's an all white client and they're looking to reach black or brown people and they don't have black or brown people in their company, what they need to feel comfortable doing is stepping aside and centering the work, the conversation, the funds to black and brown people. If they have black and brown people within their company, it's how do we bring them to the table? right and then it's working with people such as yourselves either externally or internally to build that structure within the company so the two go hand in hand right um you know i i don't work on say employing people or that sort of that side of things but the the two one begats the other like there's no point creating an amazing external as you've seen with many companies actually external image of black and brown or queer culture or whatever, but it's really crappy to be a black or brown person working there, right? Because at some point you will get found out. Right. Let's, you know, let's look at Nike, Adidas. You, it's a oh. roll call of companies where this has happened, right? And so the two need to go hand in hand. But I, I'm a firm believer now in it that whatever, wherever you are in the journey, like it's a start. You, you know, you can't just be like, oh, you've never done this, so I'm never going to work with you. Who was it uh, who I heard say this? I think it, it might have been, um, I think it was DK Bartley, who's the chief diversity officer at Moody's. Yes, it was. And uh, um, he was, I had a chance to hear him speak. Uh, a couple of years ago and over the last, you know, over the last couple of years, diversity, equity and inclusion work has really exploded, particularly in the last 12 months. And um, it was, someone had asked him the question of, well, what do you, what do you, how do you feel about the companies that are just joining? And he said, well, I'm glad, think, welcome to the party. Like, I'm glad you're here. You know, spending energy on why we weren't here before is, is not, it's not going to solve anything. Let's, let's, Let's move forward and make some things happen. Um, and I, I love that thinking. I have to say though, Rana, I love this the softer side of Rana. Um, I, I, it's it's so beautiful. And I hope you don't, and I'm sure you won't. I mean, one of the things that I have shared about our partnership over the years has been that I'm so grateful for people like you who are are not are gonna be a little bit no holds barred and say, like, this isn't okay. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a, yeah, you need to hear this, you need to see this, you need to solve this. Um, because one thing that I'm I'm aware of is uh that uh and I've I've had a number of moments of this over the last few years as I've come to understand how the systems of oppression um have impacted how I do my work and how I show up every day, is that I learned how to sanitize things and make things okay and make things comfortable for often cisgender straight white men um and um and so i need people like you to push uh so so don't lose that part ronnie because we, well, we need it what, what i'll say brian is i'm i'm focusing that eye now on the ad agencies and the the marketing structure because they are the ones that have really started to get on my nerves in that like you cannot move now for oh we've hired a black person we've got a woman here you know, he's an Asian, right? Or we'll do like try adverts for like stop Asian hate, but like your job is to shepherd and guide brands into the nexus of where culture is, right? Mm -hmm. And I find that they are the, the most resistant in stepping aside for black and brown or other marginalized people to come through, right? Because it affects their bottom line. 
So what they're trying to do is co-opt and you can see it in so much work. You can always see like queer work that is done through just like white gay men, or you can see black work that is put through the lens of a white executive creative director, right? Mm -hmm. And it's this thing which I talk about of a work that is like professionally black or professionally Latin, or, you, you know, and it's the same people that get cast, the same directors that get hired, the same casting directors, right? And my, my wonder is that there's this, there's this grip on black, brown, marginalized talent, which is not changing. Why are none of the main agents black? I deal with one agent in Hollywood, the amazing guy, Darnell Strong, who is of color. So who, what, a lot of what I'm working on now, Brian, is who, who holds the keys to the stories that are told, right? Mm. And who is advising the client? Because the client's a marketeer, right? The client's looking at bottom line and spreadsheets for Walmart. So these ad agencies and these media agencies, they don't know, right? They don't really exist in that intersection of class, race, gender, you know, I scroll, they're all the ones that were in the Hamptons for, for pandemic, you know? So how are they telling people how to buy soap? You know, that's where I've got my particular bugbear at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, you know, the other part of what, so I'm glad to hear you didn't lose that passion. Um, of course, I, I wasn't actually worried about it, but I just, I wanted you to hear that that we need it because it's helped me and I know I have no doubt that it's helped others as well. Um, you know, the other part of what you shared is something that I continue to explore though of, and I'm going to use my language here is, I, I feel like we have cast um, cisgender, straight, white, able-bodied men as the villains in the story. Um, and, uh, and they were the villains. Like that's that there, that there is some truth in that. Like the country was was founded on uh, oppression, systems of oppression. Um, mm. But the men of today are whether accomplices or you know either innocent accomplices or active accomplices. But they um, but they didn't create the system that is today. Mm. But, but so I, I, I'm like I continue to think about how do we take them out of the villain seat. Um, and how do we find ways to, because we need that group of, of individuals to be part of the work and part of the conversation. And what, what are the, the, what's the language? What's the, uh, the approach? What are the things that will, will get them in the room and get them engaged? But you're right. A lot of this is systemic, Brian. This is why I have an issue with the ad agencies, because they are often perpetuating systems because it supports their bottom line that clients are not even really interested in anymore. So if I think about Unilever, you know, like my, my primary client, and the, the, the person that brought me in is a, is a black woman, AC, but my day-to-day my -day client is a straight, watches football, you know, Rob Master, he's an amazing guy. And that's what I mean about unity and allyship. And what he displays for me is um, openness and willingness to listen, like I feel heard. It's the same with the team I work with at General Motors. You know, like, this is what I mean, but, and also that's my personal journey, Brian, is like, as I come across these clients, which on the whole, it's more that sort of client than the other sort of client, particularly in the style of brands I work with, it, um, it validates me, it makes me feel positive. You know, I'd call out as well, Leo Burnett, which is uh, Leo Burnett Detroit that I work with. You know, I sit at the table, right? And what, what, what you find is this all becomes about individuals. And this is what I mean, that then I'll come across other individuals that um, will gaslight me or will um, really not want to hear about this stuff, right? And for me, they are still the villain. But like you say, it's not a one size fits all. What I think has come into the lexicon, which is different, is my ability to call those people out. So terms like white fragility, unconscious bias, um, all the terms that you know, <laughs> basically gaslighting, right? I didn't know that that was the thing that would happen, right? Yeah. But, but now there is a language around that and also, people are more aware that if I act in this way, I could lose my job. And it's not about full frontal racism or homophobia or transphobia. It's about a way that you're behaving to me, right? 
as a as a vendor or as a partner or whatever that is just inequitable and so that's changed you know and i've had it i've had it with some clients but it's, it's such a case by case basis so i think it's about the individuals that you come across but i also think it's going to be really difficult to hold a cmo cmo role nowadays and be a closed-minded person that's not my experience of cmos the experience where i get the barriers is often at the middle manager level well that doesn't that that is one of the areas that is a, is a real challenge just in dei as a whole is the middle manager so um mm -hmm. that i know there, there's a lot of work and research being done to figure out how do we impact that population um you know something else that i'm hearing as we're having this conversation um, and really some of the things you just said is you know, something that I know you and I both believe in and why I think we our, our partnership um, at, at Tapestry and Coach really worked is that DEI and commitments to inclusion and commitments to diversity, it's not just one part of the organization. It has to be throughout the whole organization um, and everything you do. And otherwise it's inauthentic or it doesn't or it doesn't work. Um, or you know, it's to your point of uh, you can hire a queer person of color like yourself to do a marketing campaign, um, but if you're not inclusive and you're not going to let your voice be heard, then you're going to miss out on the possibility of what that could what that could look like. Um, so that you know, so do do you partner with other DEI leaders? I, I know that you and I talked a lot. Yeah, not not externally. Like I think in nearly every brand that I work on now has it in some sort of way. DEI, and I think that where it makes my life easier is it's this coming off the fence, Brian. So, you know, and we've talked about this before that once a brand posts that they're black square or they're rainbow or whatever, then I know I've got them. Because once you've publicly said it, you have to live up to it. Otherwise it's performative. And what, what I've seen grow is the role of the, the DEI professional, maybe even you were probably the first person I'd met in that role. I'm trying to think back on clients. The other thing that has grown, which didn't used to be around for me, is the employee resource groups. So that 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 was kind of new as well. And, you know, I'll often start to deal with them now. I take SoulCycle is a great example where they have one for black instructors and workers. Then they've got brown, LGBTQ, you know, and that that's also can be its own issue where we start to hit intersections. You know, Pride was a big one where I was starting to get pushback from like white gay men about why are we focusing just on kind of like trans women of color or whatever. You know, Pride is our thing too. And so, you know, everything has layers upon layers. But I think that my, my thing is, in a way, the more the merrier, because if the organization is coming along, the staff have to feel correct. You know, my the big thing, one of the big things for 22, 2022 for me is looking at um, the shop floor or the factory floor. So what I find is a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is benefiting or is involving head office, right? But isn't necessarily involving and again that to me is an intersection with class economics but i'll give you an example um if a brand gives its head office juneteenth as a day of a, a federal holiday but you don't have your employees on the shop floor able to do the same thing but predominantly your employees on the shop floor are made up of black or brown people or whatever it's not working for me <laughs> right yep. these are things that are these are new things that i'm learning to look at you know i'm also learning to look at or how i work with external affairs and the like grown-up governmenty bit right and the these the it, it's learning this brian and you know i've learned that from tapestry as one of the companies because then when I go into a new client, I can understand, would you have this person? Do you have this person? Because you know from working inside corporations that otherwise it's like these small fiefdoms where the DEI person is doing their thing, the HR person is doing their thing because there's no forum where they all talk to each other. But sometimes the external agency, we are the fulcrum for talking to everyone and bringing people together, right? Yeah, well... 
Well, and, and all of those pieces have to connect and they have to align and they have to coordinate with each other and amplify each other's messages. Um, and, you know, I, one of the um, one of the stories that I really think about um, and you're, you're part of this, as, as are many others, is you know, we were able to in, increase the candidate pipeline for people of color at Tapestry, and it was because we did a bunch of things. It was that we started to demonstrate that our commitment in external advertising and marketing and the imagery. We had we had messages about what we were doing internally. We reached out to partner with not-for-profits to build additional relationships with the communities and all of those things. And you know, it's um, I think one of the things that is you know tough about this work is it is it is so multidimensional. And so getting your head around all of the different pieces of it can be can prove to be a bit challenging. What are the um, if you, what are the biggest um, pitfalls that you've seen, you know that that you've uh, you know, or you encourage companies to avoid? Uh, of like, here's how you can get it wrong when you're trying to um, it, it, focus on diversity in your marketing campaigns. Where what is that? So I'm going to paraphrase AC because I, I can't. She's been a huge influence on me. AC at Unilever. And so I, I was fully in the say, how is this going to reach people, right? Um, and what I wasn't focusing on was the do. What is the meaningful, measurable change that you're looking to make, right? So this is how I start now with every single brand that I work on where it's kind of purpose led in their activity. So the traditional act of purpose is to give money right and to say you're giving money but that's not enough like Unilever have really shown me like I look at their work with the Crown Act around hair discrimination that you can change laws right I didn't think you could do that in the style of work that I do so I really look at well what is the do you're looking to do so if you take Unilever you know if we take pride because it's kind of fresh at the moment you know Unilever is is working with different cities that have scored zero on the human rights municipality index so they're creating frontline and systemic change in cities where there's no meaningful lgbtq protections or infrastructure soul cycle are doing a thing called community bikes where they're working with a network of different um queer and uh, trans-led or organizations across the US to open up uh, bikes to people because of the direct correlation between physical health and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, if I take coach, coach is looking at safe spaces, both um, online and physical for young uh, queer people. So working with uh, Glisten, Centrelink, Hedrick Martin Institute. So what I say to the brands is, well, let's look first and foremost at what is it you're gonna do, right? And then on top of that, as we've talked about before, is how are we centering this around those people, right? How are we building equity in the entire marketing process? So who is commissioning the content? Who is casting the content? Who is directing the content? Who is creating the messaging? Who is starring in front of the campaign? How is it being cascaded through an organization? Like new stuff that I learned this year is that you can get a CEO to do a letter on LinkedIn. I didn't know you could do that, right? So every year, it's a bit like a building blocks. So I learn like, oh, here's another bit that we can tinker with that I didn't think was in my toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. But how important is it for young or any age, black people, queer people, women, to see the CEO of the company they work for saying, I see you, I send to you, I believe in you and I stand for you, right? That's allyship. Right. But also within that to say, these are the things that we're doing, not just, you know, then the new thing for me is the factory and shop floor. How am I making sure that the so-called worker and not just the head office it, that this is reaching them? Right. Um, you know, and then I work with people like yourselves to say, well, you know, if it's Juneteenth, how are these people getting time off why is it those people and that's almost your job to do with HR is to work out what well, you know so it's there's my equity verticals or whatever and then they mirror with your equity verticals right and the two you can't have one without the other yeah they work in symbiosis absolutely yeah. absolutely well and the 
um, the the orientation to action, the commitment to action, the demonstration of action uh, is uh, is so important um, in you know the um, I, you know I I have this belief and I don't have a lot of evidence to back this up. Um, uh, but you, you, you'll have worked um, likely with Jennifer Lehman at Tapestry, the head of communications. I don't know if you've met her. She's phenomenal. I, I learned so much about communications from her. And, um, you know, the uh, and she does not, I would say, buy into the, the old systems of how corporate communications were designed, which was risk mitigation, <laughs> Um, sharing just what you need to share, um, and uh, you know, it was really about protection. And uh, and she allowed it to be, you know, she helped us make and deliver communications that were very human and very real and were balanced and included commitments and actions. And um, and those, uh, I think, there's still a lot of work for you know the the companies who make these statements. Um, and you're right, I think that there are there's still a place for those statements because. Uh, a CEO saying, I see you, um, I see you as a transgender person or as a, a person of color or as a person with a disability and I'm here for you and I want to support you. Uh, that is important. Um, and uh, if, if action doesn't follow, then at some point it starts to, it eats away on the credibility of that. Mm, no, 100%. Coach is a great example. Like they have a great team that are just like willing, but you are right that, you know, there's, there's still that don't complain, don't explain if we don't say anything, but that those days have gone. Social media took that away, you know, because don't complain, don't explain works when you have a monologue relationship with your customer base. But when it's a dialogue, when they can leave comments, when they can call you out, when they can go on LinkedIn and look at what do the people look like that are making this stuff or saying this stuff, you, you, you know, they, they can be so forensic now that your marketing, your equity, your purpose, has to have the same level within it. Absolutely. Well, and I feel like I, I should just given this conversation mention the reason we know each other <laughs> is because there was an authentic conversation that happened on social media. Um, and for those who don't know the, the story, um, there was um, a, a, an email that was uh, sent to Dominique Jackson, one of the stars of Pose, who was representing Pride at a Pride, the Pride Ball um, three years ago now, I think. Um, and uh, the, the email uh, misgendered Dominique. Um, and uh, while I do believe it was an honest error, uh, it was also not okay and it should have never happened. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there was this debate and there was the debate of the traditional corporate rules of communication. Do we send that message or do we send a message that is authentic and real. And we said, Dominique, we got it wrong. And we would love to talk about um, how we can make it right. And what does that look like? And Dominique graciously accepted that invitation. And that's how you and I met. And, you know, it is, and it is having that dialogue. And I remember, uh, you know, sitting across from Dominique and her sharing uh, about her, her fight for recognition as a woman um, every day. And uh, and how that moment just it just unlocked unleashed years of pain and hurt and um, and uh, and it was upsetting and I and I, I'll never forget that moment. Mm. Uh, but I think you know to your to as your to your point, coach is a brand that says we're not going to shy away from real conversations. We're gonna we're gonna engage. Yeah, coach is amazing. The, the other point I'd make it wasn't just about misgendering to me. It was an expectation that queer people show up for pride without being paid. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, that I think there were multiple layers to it. But again, look, people make mistakes. It's human. What they say to err is human. It's about how you deal with that. Because like you say, Brian, it, it wasn't from a space of malice. It wasn't from a space of evil. It's what you do to make an amend. And I remember us all having this conversation that an amend is amend. So we go to someone and say, how can I make this right? Right. And, you know, that's, I, I prefer not to be called in at that stage, but when you're called <laughs> in at that stage, you know, because people just hunker down, nothing gets sorted then. So, you know, it's about how do you go in and how, and often it can be, you know, that formed the basis for what I would say now is that coach, certainly within the fashion space, do some of the best LGBT work I see each year. 
yeah. You know, and that, that's led to that. They support all these different organizations. You know, yeah, it, it, it wasn't the best start to something, but they pay equitable money to people now and they, they learn from that situation. That's what you, that's, you know, that's what I mean is like, you can't just be about punish. Like, um, what do they say now? It's not just cancel culture. It's there's something else that another scene. Oh, I, I don't, I haven't heard this yet. I'll have to. I'll yeah. have to oh. Consequence culture. Ah. So, you know, they, they understood it and they came through and that's, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, one of the messages that I try to uh, try to reinforce as much as I can is uh I believe that mo that all of us get up and want to be a good human today, and that looks different for different people. And some days you have better days than other days, and you know. And um, but if you start from we're all doing our best, and that means sometimes we're still going to get it wrong. Um, and then the question is, did I learn from those mistakes? Like that's um, you know that I think that's a I just prefer that way of living and existing. Uh, and and certainly that you know as you said, coach learned from that moment. The other thing that I actually say about that moment um, when I'm so first of all, I agree with you. The um, and uh, one of the things that we we really encourage our clients to do, and probably beyond courage, push and nudge and um, and ask them multiple times if we need to is. Are you going to pay, you know, you mentioned those employee resource groups, those leaders of those employee resource groups are giving time, energy and sharing their lived experience to benefit the organization. Uh, and so are you paying them? Are you paying your inclusion advisory council members? Are you paying people that you're asking to share their, their lived experience with you for, for a brand purpose or product design? What does that look like? Uh, the other thing that I share is um, and when I'm, um, when I share the story of, with the, the, the Dominique, uh, email and the, the partnership that was, was, uh, was, um, uh, transpiring there was, I also think that a brand has a responsibility if you are going to engage, um, a community, whatever that community is, a marginalized oppressed community, that you have a responsibility to, to understand that community at some level. I, I, I'm not going to say you have to understand everything about every, you know, every aspect of that community, but you got to start. Um, and I think that was part of what um, felt like it was missing there, um, which I know Carlos was like, how did I, how did this happen as a, as a, you know, as a gay man who's really committed to celebrating um, the LGBTQ plus community. Mm. I, you know, one thing, actually, I want to make sure that we um, uh, uh, bring this up, and you, we've alluded to this a couple times in the conversation already, is, you know, our pride programming for Hummingbird Hour this month, or this year, really centered around um, everyone but uh, cisgender gay white men, people that look like me, um, because we need to elevate uh, the, the other stories and the other messages. Uh, I'm curious, how, how has pride felt for you as, a, as a, a person of color who's part of the LGBTQ plus community? It's, uh, I think it's kind of draining that you're still having to have the same conversations um that I would say I think that for me I had a naivety that oh Biden will get in and it'll all be good and then this whole new front line of like laws and statutes and city ordinances have come to the fore but also it, it's it's what what I see is this kind of generational schism and, you know, I look at it from how New York is being that, you know, I went on the Reclaim Pride March and I think that there's a battle for what is pride, right? Uh, what is it as a concept? But my, my general line of thumb is like, until all of the community have those rights and privileges, then to be honest, that's where the focus is. Like, I'm really unequivocal about that. And I think that it, it's kind of... Um, you know, it, what, what I'd say, Brian, that is, is coming to the fore is much more of an education around LGBTQ history. Like I even see like the, the, the documentaries, the FX stuff that was on mm. um, Hulu, like stuff that I didn't know, I didn't understand, you know, no one, no one teaches this stuff, right? And so it's this, this thing again of like, who gets to celebrate and how, right? And then what are the messages that we need to tell and how do we find the balance between that, right? 
And I think that that is the, not necessarily the battleground, but I saw it a lot with brands where they would center in front of the camera, um, transgender non-conforming people, but it's still a white photographer taking the picture, right? <laughs> you know, they're not really understanding equity. If I could count the number of brands that just is 100K check to glad, that's the sum total of our activity, right? If I could count the number of brands that just hide behind a rainbow, they don't show any queer people. Like, like you know, I live in Chelsea. The pride is already off the Google O's. It's like July 5th. Like, they must have gone overnight to do that, you know? And so it's just, it's what I thank is I heartfelt thank the black community and the activists within the black community because everything that they are doing is having a domino effect on other communities, what we will stand for, what we'll accept, how we can learn. And I also learned that that's always been the case. You know, I learned that the Black Panthers talk at the Gay Liberation Front, how to be activists. You know, I learned these things. I see the intersection between um, activists like Queen Jean, who is leading the Stonewall protests every week, you know, and so on the one side, it's draining that this is still not changing at the pace. But on the other side, I have to live in this idea of joy, abundance, thriving and what different communities deserve. And I have to stay in a level of hope, mm. right? Because otherwise it, it just drags you down, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and that's you know, the, 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 the way that when I have my moments where I'm feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. or, um, or I just think that this work, uh, like, how is it going to be possible? Cause I, cause I, as I continue to understand the systems of oppression that exist more and more, I'm like, how are we going to tear them apart? Um, and, uh, cause they're, they're, um, invisible and they're so powerful and they're self-perpetuating and, um, and then I remember, uh, and I remind myself that there are so many people who every day through are doing something to try to make the world a better place. And through a collection of all those small acts, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to change the world, I believe. And so that, that's where hope comes from. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the things you said at the very beginning, which we didn't come back to was, uh, and uh, and I guess we did in some ways, but the power of language and how how things are evolving. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what are the what do you think is uh, the the next evolution of of this you know this work for companies to represent everyone in their um, in their brands? Um, what's what's going to come next? I don't know. It's difficult. Like it, you know, we're we're looking at 2022 now, and I think the you know systemic change. Is, it, is going to be a huge thing. Next year is a tumultuous year. You can't divorce anymore what happens. Like the midterms is going to be a hectic time, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can't divorce what is going on in society from, you know, what is going on in the brand world. And, you know, new language comes up all of the time and lexicon comes up all the time. I think it's for me how that language is created, who's creating it, who's centering it. You know, one of the things that I'm really on the fence around is this term Latinx, because Latinx feels like a business term, whereas Hispanic communities don't seem to want to take it on, right? It's also understanding all of the nuances that exist within different communities. The black community is not just one mass of like people that are all the same right you talked about disability and people with disabilities there are so many front lines that are colliding and kind of like integrating at the moment that it, it's an exciting time and also just the channels that exist you know one of the things that's really interesting to me at the moment is um this so-called strike by black tiktokers because white tiktokers are making all the money off of essentially black culture right which again is about who gets to who gets to commission, who gets to tell the stories, who gets to be elevated, right? And who is doing that in the brand world? Who is spending the money? Who are the casting agents, right? Mm -hmm. And all of this sort of stuff. So I don't have an easy answer for that, Brian, because it changes daily. You know, it changes like, there wasn't a TikTok strike, but it makes complete sense. You know, all of these dance moves come from black culture. So why are all these white TikTokers making all of this massive money doing black dance moves? 
right? And so it changes daily because then that allows me to say to brands that I'm working with, well, look, we need to look at the TikTok strategy. Why are you just paying all of these people all this money, but not these people? So it, it changes all of the time. Well, and 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 I think businesses continue to grapple with this every day of um and you know, I didn't, I didn't live in the 50s and 60s, so I can't speak to what business was like then. My sense of the stories I've heard was it was fairly static and stable. And over, you know, over the last 40 years, businesses had a, a fair amount of disruption. And the the current pace of change uh, means you have to you have to commit to to continuing to li listen and to learn and to engage uh, different representation in the conversations. Mm -hmm. It's one o'clock, Rana. You know I could talk to you for hours. Um, uh, always, always a pleasure. Any any final words you'd like to share with the group? Not really. Just thank you for having me. It's always good to talk about this stuff because I it helps me percolate, kind of where I stand on stuff. Because it's often you don't get to just stop and think, you, you, you know. And that these conversations really help me do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we're because we're often doing, um, and uh, yeah. Well, and I feel the same way. I, I always think when I when I have a hummingbird hour conversation or join a panel conversation, I'm always I'm always learning. I hope that I'm adding something, but I really I often take a lot away. So, thank you so much for your wisdom and for your passion and for your work, and uh, wishing you a peaceful July after a very busy June. Uh, yes. And uh, we'll see you soon. Everyone out there listening and watching, thank you for being with us. Um, and until next week, be well and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian.